I keep forgetting to do it. Okay, all right. So today it's a great pleasure to have Tudor uh, Dimofte who's going to speak about the algebraic structures of boundary and effect. So I'm really looking forward to it because I, uh, given Tudor's past talks, I'm thinking today is the day I'll finally understand boundaries and defects. So over to you. Um, yeah, that's a good good challenge for me. So so I was indeed uh, tasked by Min Hyung to say something about boundaries and defects. Um, and I will try. Uh, while writing this talk, I started realizing that I would likely make uh, both physicists and mathematicians in the audience uh, cringe horribly at various points. I apologize for that in advance. Um, I'm going to try to say mainly some some simple things and some occasionally uh, oversimplified things. Um, and I'm unlikely to get to say anything too interesting about 3D and 4D and Langlands, um, just time-wise. Um, but I am happy to talk about it later. Um, so, right. Um, my main goal uh, is to say a few things in particular about boundary conditions. Um, in quantum field theories, um, at some point I'm going to specialize to topological quantum field theories um, because their the algebraic properties are easier to describe. Um, and I will focus a lot on two dimensions and start to explain how things generalize to, uh, to the higher dimensions. Um, now, there's defects in the title. Um, otherwise called extended operators. Um, maybe a point to make at the beginning is that um, understanding boundary conditions in various dimensions is sufficient for understanding defects in various higher dimensions. Um, sufficient in some, some at least in principle. Um, so, Um, in principle, sufficient uh, for characterizing extended operators. In defects. And this entire statement uh, applies to TQFT. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, possibly an analogy. Um, is that understanding how to quantize Hilbert spaces in quantum mechanics tells you how to produce local operators in TQFTs in any dimension. Um, so quantum mechanics meaning one dimensional. T um, leads to uh, at least in vector spaces of local operators in TQFT in any dimension, T, um, 
And the trick is to use a state operator correspondence here. So you would say that in the space of local operators uh, in D dimensions, well, in, T in sort of in TQFT formalism mathematically, this is the thing that's called Z of SD minus one. Uh, physically, uh, this is the same as the Hilbert space on a D minus one sphere times R. Um, and so if you're clever enough uh, to rewrite the D-dimensional uh, TQFT as a one-dimensional uh, the, the T is not really necessary anymore. Um, I just will put it in. Um, where in the one dimensional TQFT, um, the space is just the line of time, and the target, the space time, <laughs> uh, and the target is sort of all field configurations on SD minus one, which is some gigantic infinite dimensional thing. So if initially we had a sigma model to X, now we have a one dimensional sigma model whose target is maps from SD minus one to X, um, then you just quantize as you usually would in quantum mechanics. So this is a very standard, standard construction. Um, so then. So, sorry, when you said the Hilbert space on S D minus one cross R, that's a D dimensional manifold, but you said it's a D dimensional TQFT. So it should, shouldn't associate a Hilbert space to a D minus one dimensional manifold. Um, it depends how, what your language is. Um, so, plus one so, so in math language, yes, this is why I wrote Z of SD minus one. Uh, in physics, it's a, it's a D minus one dimensional manifold times time. The Hilbert space is like a space of states that propagates in time. And it's oh, okay. sort of important to emphasize that the extra dimensions are there. Um, there's there's a, some sort of stabilization feature where whatever you would like, to an n manifold, when you say z of an n manifold, physically you're actually thinking z of you're thinking a d dimensional QFT on the n manifold times r to the d minus n. Okay. Um, it's just it's just that. Um, so with extended operators, one does the same sort of thing. Um, Wait, sorry, why are we quantizing a quantum field theory? I mean, you're, because I am secretly thinking of everything is actually coming from a quantization of the classical theory. So you're, you you would like you would have field configurations of the classical theory on SD minus one, and you would quantize that. I would. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that that is like this is not just an in principle thing. This this is literally how local operators are constructed in many examples of uh, of higher dimensional theories that we know. Um, most recently like the, the BFN construction of the Coulomb branch of 3DN equals four theories works exactly this way. It is this sort of construction that involves a reduction um, along a slightly algebraic two sphere and analyzing appropriate field configurations there. Um, and of course, this is extremely pervasive throughout CFT where it's similar thing with works with state operator correspondences. 
at this point, I need to recall that if I talk too much, my display stops getting mirrored. Okay, so um, so similarly, um, if you want to say something about line operators, for example, in D dimensions, well, this is what formally it's with the mathematical theory. Formal TQFT would assign to a D minus two sphere. Uh, but what's actually going on um, is that we have some operators supported on a line in D dimensions. The link of this line is a D minus two sphere. Um, and we can think of out of the D minus a line topologically um, as S D minus two times R times R plus. Um, and, or I mean, topologically, it's SD minus two times R times R. Um, I want to think of things like that. So we have SD minus two times the half space, where the edge of this half space um, is, is the original line I started with. Line, line. Um, and then by rewriting a d dimensional theory um, as a two dimensional theory whose target is maps from SD minus two to the original target, um, now in principle, all we have to do is describe boundary conditions for this two dimensional theory, and we will automatically know about line operators. In, in D dimensions. Um, and this, this works the same way for various other extended operators. The idea is compactify on the link, reduce all the way down until your operator now becomes a boundary condition. You always do that. Um, and then think about boundary conditions in the appropriate number of dimensions. Um, okay, that said, um, so I've sort of formally reduced everything to boundary conditions, um, and we now need to understand how boundary conditions work. Oh, sorry, um, to the, to the, just yeah. one, one question. Did you also say that this um, Z S D D minus two, what the theory assigns to S D minus two, is also what you in the, these are the operators you insert along lines? Yes. Uh, because mm -hmm. and the way that translation works is by by taking the link of right, right. of R inside R to the D. Yeah, this is just the same as the point operators. I see, but but Z S D minus two will be a category then, right? Exactly, it will be a category, mm -hmm. um, and boundary conditions in two dimensions. always from a category. Um, so this is maybe one, one way to, to figure out that what you're shooting for when you say line operators in D dimensions is a category. Right. Um, Sudhir, uh, can I ask a quick question? Uh, yeah. We know famously that uh, framing is important for line operators in various dimensions. So how does it get encoded on this right-hand side to make sure I understand the picture? Um, So framing is also important for boundary conditions in, um, in So how do we see, for example, that we get Z valued framing for D equals three and Z two valued framing for D equals four?
think locally there's that that's no the that's that's the sd minus two um sorry so um right yeah, that, that, that's coming up. that's coming from Hamatopi of of sd minus two um which means that if if like if you literally just rewrite the theory this is now going to be a some property of the target and from the two-dimensional perspective. Um, there, there's also another, like I have oversimplified this horribly. There's another really major thing that's missing. Um, namely, like in 3D, you know that line operators in a 3D TQFT are braided. Uh, it's not just a category, but it's a braided tensor category. Um, and in, in higher dimensions, there is, some higher notion of braiding that that shows up. Um, that's that's not quite as interesting. Uh, and again, that I I can't actually describe that tensor product and braiding in a, in a two dimensional perspective. All that this is good for is identifying the category um, as just as an ordinary category. Um, I I think um, things like Framing can still be understood from a target space perspective in 2D and things like tensor product and braiding, just I, can't. Oh, sorry, and I just a question. Oh, so when you say when you say the line operators correspond to this category, you mean the morphisms of this category act as the line operators? No, uh, I mean the objects of this category are, are line operators. I, I will make that clear. Um, and so morph you have morphisms between line operators then? You do. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just draw the picture now. So um, in D dimensions, what you would consider is something like this, uh, where there's a local operator that, that can connect two different line operators L and L prime. Um, and so the space of things that can sit there is HOM L L prime. Um, and if you wanted to understand this from, or to sort of write it the same way from a formal TQFT perspective, um, you would write this as, Z of a sphere with decorations. Um, so this is Z of a, now a D minus one sphere with some L and L prime decorations at the poles. Um, or it's, yeah. Um, um, and that, that sort of picture with local operators just translates to a picture with local operators on, on a boundary in two dimensions. Um, Twitter, Twitter, could I ask a question here? Yeah, it's correct. Um, so here in your upper uh, in the northeast part of your slide, I think it's important to distinguish d equals two from d bigger than two because um, the zero sphere is not connected. Mm. I'm Also, there's actually an issue there. No, sorry, it, it absolutely, that's absolutely, that's absolutely right. So, so this is where in D equals two, something interesting is happening and you really need to understand boundary conditions from some sort of first principles analysis. On the other hand, if you're in, right, this, what I just said applies to D greater than or equal to three. I mean, it leads to a real issue because there's a difference between 
um, extended TQFT in two, one, and two oh. and open closed topological field theory. Oh, sorry, Greg, so, but um, I think this applies also to D equals two. So, so if D is equal to two. Okay. Then a line operator is a thing that it is, a line operator is an interface between the theory and itself. That's true. Okay. And, and that's, that's the same thing. Okay. As, Sorry. Yeah. Right? Okay. You're, was, you're okay. right. Um, you're right. Um, but I'm, okay. There's still an issue here, but I'll bring it up at the end of the talk. Um, so I, in order, so, so I, I sort of want to get to a statement that boundary conditions should look like Lagrangian phase space. Um, and my goal in this discussion is to say some very simple things to maybe a math part of the audience who hasn't seen these very simple things before. Um, so a, Prototype for understanding boundary conditions in Lagrangian theories. Theories that have fields. Uh, is going to come from looking at calling the boundary conditions is weird, but gives the right idea. Um, one dimensional QFT. I.e. quantum mechanics. Um, and I should also say time and space for me are the same thing. Everything at this talk is Euclidean. Um, so um, let me consider the simplest example. Um, so kind of 1D. Sigma model. With target R. Um, in other words, this is a theory of maps. From a line of time. To our target R. Call the maps. X of T. Um, there is a standard action for such things. It has a kinetic term, it's the integral of half the time derivative of X squared. Um, there might be some potential. It's a standard action. Um, in order to talk about boundary conditions, it's con convenient, not required, but convenient to rewrite this in a first order formalism. Um, so we'll introduce momentum as a priori and independent field. Um, and write this as minus a half p squared uh, plus dx plus dx um, And so now um, I'm looking at maps from from time to r squared, where both x and p are, are functions here. Um, OK. Um, so if, if our line of time is not a full line, but a half line, then uh, we're integrating from the fixed point 0. 
Um, and to get equations of motion, one learns at some point early on uh, to set the functional uh, derivative of the action to zero. If we take a variation of what's sitting under that integral, it's p variation of p uh, plus variation of the potential plus variation of px dot plus p variation of x dot. Um, and the tricky term here is the p variation of x dot. Um, the, there, uh, that, I, I guess, what did we say? Uh, one would like to write this in a form uh, that involves an integral of things multiplied by the variation of p or by the variation of x in in the bulk, um, meaning I should do an integration by parts and get a boundary term. So this becomes um, minus p plus x dot Variation of p plus whatever the variation of the potential is, um, plus p variation of x, the other sign. Um, and setting the coefficients of variation of p and variation of x here to zero gives us the usual bulk equations of motion. This thing that we introduced as p is, as we want, the derivative of x. Um, and uh, then there's an equation. Okay. Uh, this is an integration by parts. Uh, there's an equation coming from the variation of x that sets the derivative of p equal to the derivative of the potential. But then there's a boundary term, which is the thing I actually want to focus on. Um, there's minus p variation of x evaluated at zero. Um, and there, there are two ways to deal with these boundary terms, uh, sort of an active and a passive approach. Um, the passive approach is to do nothing and simply require the thing multiplied by the variation of x, both in the bulk and on the boundary, to vanish. That would just simply passively set p equals zero at time zero. And that is one way to let the action itself give you a boundary condition. Um, the other option is an active approach, uh, which is what I'll actually discuss. Um, and so we need to introduce. A boundary condition at time zero such that this boundary term uh, p times the variation of x is zero. Um, let me copy this and move on to another page. Um, there are two simple options. Either we set p equals zero, but p is the same thing as x dot. Um, and this is a prototype of a Neumann boundary condition. 
uh, or you set x to be constant. This is a prototype of the Dirichlet boundary condition. Now, you can actually do other things. Um, and to do other things, it helps to rephrase what's going on a bit more geometrically. Um, so um, there is a phase space here. Um, whose coordinates are x and p, and there's a symplectic form on phase space that looks like the pdx. And the thing that's showing up, this problematic boundary term, um, is actually the Leva 1 form. Um, and so what we found, um, also please, please interrupt if you want, like I, I'm throwing out words like phase space. Um, I'm happy to say more about how one would define that in general. Um, otherwise I will just skip it. Um, so the condition Uh, a boundary condition above uh, corresponded to some submanifold um, L and P such that the Leva one form restricted to L was zero. A quick question. Um, yes. So when you say X equals constant, that means that you're varying by a field that's just a constant in time? Um, I don't. What, what I mean is that we're going to declare that at time zero, um, the value of our field X is fixed. We're going to say fix it to be zero or fix it to be five. Oh, okay. um, and, and that means that so X at zero is some constant C and that implies that the variation of X Ah, okay. Zero, zero. Great. That's that's how that's working. Um, now, the there's a modification one can introduce to the action above. Um, so a more general setup uh, is to introduce introduce an arbitrary boundary term. the action. Say so the full action is S plus S boundary, where S boundary only depends on values of the fields at zero. There's just some function of X and P at zero. Um, this doesn't affect the bulk equations of motion at all. But now, the condition that boundary terms go away, um, I think we might need a negative sign here. Um, the condition that boundary terms go away is not that the Leva one form vanishes, but that the Leva one form restricted to O is a, is a total derivative. Now this ensures uh, vanishing boundary terms. Um, and F can be arbitrary. Yeah, I, as, as I said. Right. What, um, what is L? Is L still 
L is no longer a Lagrangian manifold. What is L? I, I didn't say L was Lagrangian in the first place. Um, L is the manifold that we're going to restrict our fields to live on at time zero. Um, and so good choices of L are ones such that the level one form is exact after, restri after a restriction or after a pullback to L. Okay. Um, and so this is a more general thing that's allowable. Um, and this, of course, implies that the symplectic form restricted to our boundary condition vanishes, which implies that our boundary condition is isotropic. So it cannot be too large. Now, there are various ways. So, so this gives us one constraint on, on that boundary condition. Um, there are various ways to see the other constraint, that it also cannot be too small. Um, so what one hears often in physics is that one should not over-constrain the equations of motion. Uh, here, ultimately, our field X has an equation of motion with two derivatives. Um, and somehow allowed to fix the value of x or its first derivative, but not both. Um, one nice way to see that the submanifold cannot be too small um, is to consider what happens after quantization. Um, so this is an independent analysis from what I just said. Um, functions of the fields x and p uh, become an associative algebra so in geometric quantization of this phase space. Uh, one gets a Heisenberg algebra. where in suitable normalizations, uh, P and X commutes to a constant, usually called H bar. Um, and the boundary condition becomes a module uh, for this algebra. Let's call this algebra A. And there's a picture that I usually have in my head when writing this. So the algebra A consists of literally, if one were constructing it in the path integral approach, consists of various insertions of X's and P's along the line of time. Um, they it's associative because you can't move them past each other and they all act on some vector space of operators that's sitting on the boundary. Um, um, now, the naive thing that one learns in physics is that you can't, there's a Heisenberg uncertainty relation, um, and you can't set both x and p to constants or to zero. Um, in terms of modules, uh, we can't, um, sorry, also this, this module had better be generated by something. Um, hmm. 
sorry. So in physics, by which I mean simultaneously, let's suppose that our module is generated is cyclic and so generated by some element one, um, then we can't have both P and X uh, set to zero on that generator since PX commute to, to a constant. Um, the fancier mathematics way to say this is that Bernstein's inequalities come into play. Um, and that that's a more general way to say what's going on. Um, so we have Bernstein's inequality that the homological or Delphin Kirillov dimension of whatever this module is um, had better be greater than or equal to a half the dimension of our phase space that we were quantizing in the first place. Um, and that's Tudor, the same. Tudor, yeah. the P in your diagram must not be confused with the P in the Heisenberg algebra. I, you mean because there's a non-trivial Hamiltonian? They're both P, right? I mean, they're both, you're denoting both by P, by the, P is a point or an operator? Maybe I didn't understand. P, P is an operator. Oh, you really mean P is the operator? So they are? I do. Okay, good. Sorry, so, so I, I mean X at, time one and p at time two okay, yes. at time three sorry that's what i meant um so one way or another um uh, just al algebraically um this module actually can't be too small um and to the extent i mean here in the heisenberg Heisenberg algebra it works. There is there's some characteristic variety associated with this module, and this characteristic variety had better be at least co-isotropic. What goes into Bernstein's inequality and, and what justifies this? Um so, so you're saying that you're imposing this condition on the modules? Yeah, uh, I'm saying any any module, uh, any non-zero. So, sorry. Module. Any module or was the Heisenberg this algebra. Okay. Yeah. So, so any non-zero module for the Heisenberg algebra has to satisfy this constraint. Um, you could, of course, just say that the module is literally zero. So everything, including constants, act is zero. That's I'm confused. Um, I mean, we all know that representation theory of the Heisenberg algebra is this. We 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 do, but it, but this is a thing that holds much more generally for D modules. Um, and and so should extend to to quantization more generally um, in ways that I don't know how to make precise, but I think there are several folks in the audience who do. Sorry, Tudor, but I, I, it's, is there also some general quantization principle that tells you that this classical L is the support of this quantum ML or something? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's, yes. Um, so you can either introduce H bar and talk about what happens as H bar goes to zero or do things in a filtered way. Um, if, if everything's algebraic, you can do things, you can talk about filtered quantizations, and then do uh, play around with the associated traded. Yes. I see. Okay. Right. So there, uh, I'm also a little confused about the same question maybe Greg was asking. So, uh, there are examples of high dimensional QFTs where algebra can be very complicated, such as double affine Hecke algebra and things like that. But sometimes modules can be finite dimensional whose GKA dimension is zero. So that's the state true. Um, 
but they're still, they're still coming from quantizing Lagrangians. Um, exactly, and then we still love them, right? Um, yeah, so I agree. Um, and I think you would still call them holonomic modules in that case. Um, so there, there is something affine that's coming into play here um, in, in the statements I'm making um, that are not quite going to hold when, when you're playing with a projective Lagrangians. Um, but I, I, I think if I understand correctly that, that they still give rise to holonomic modules in, in, in that quantization setup. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, so just write that down as a general expectation. No. Should be a holonomic module. Um, for for this algebra A to the extent that holonomic makes sense and what holonomic, I mean, the, the, the setting in which this does make sense. And this A in general will be, uh, the general thing will be a deformation quantization of the boundary. Exactly. Yes, I see. And, and then what holonomic usually means in modern geometric treatments, it really is that the characteristic variety or the singular support of this thing is Lagrangian. Um, which which I, I, I think encompasses these, these projected cases where the GK dimension is not, not quite right. Um, okay. um, so one can take the statement and then like even this quantum mechanics-ish discussion that that I just gave um, applies to higher dimensional QFTs that have been effectively compactified to one dimension. Um, so one can take this discussion and apply it, for example, to three e turn Simons theory. On a compact surface times time for a three manifold with boundary some compact surface where we maybe better. Uh, we think of this boundary more as a cylindrical end. Uh, that locally looks like sigma cross R. Um, so boundary conditions in Trans-Simons theory not compactified on sigma are weird things. They're not fully topological when you introduce uh, complex structures and gets to conformal field theory and stuff like that. However, if we compactify on the surface and play this game of reducing theories to lower dimensions, then effectively we have quantum mechanics. We have a one-dimensional one-dimensional QFT, um, and here the phase space, um, if it's transignments with gauge group G, the phase space um, associated to the sigma compactification uh, is flat. Uh, oh, okay, that's fine. I'll just write it as local systems. Uh, with an a T of Bot Goldman, Bape Peterson, um, symplectic form, um, and 
uh, and then literally everything applies, and this is sort of, sort of ties into the things Minhyung has been going doing, things that Sergey did a long time ago with quantum eight polynomials. Um, so yeah. Um, um, sorry, Tudor. Tudor, I have a question here. So when I think about turn Simon's theory, I think that there are two kinds of boundary conditions. There's the kinds of boundary conditions that you're talking about that give where uh, you get conformal blocks as your Hilbert space. But then if I, if I, if sigma itself has a boundary, then uh, I, I put boundary conditions and I find infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces of edge modes. Yeah, I'm absolutely not thinking about that. Right, because that, that, that's but when that's you get the, the underlying vector space in down. chiral algebra. Um, so, um, Sorry, that 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 requires some steps beyond the very simplistic discussion I just gave. I'm sorry, why why are you saying you need to compactify in order to do this trick to reduce to one dimension? Um, I'm saying that in after compactifying, one gets an ordinary phase space with a symplectic form and can talk about boundary conditions being Lagrangian in the same sense. Um, that doesn't work in turn Simons before compactifying. Um, Sorry, compactifying what part of it? Okay. So it's, it's, reducing, it's reducing the three-dimensional theory to one-dimensional theory. Um, it's, it's not so compactification we, we get, in a mathematical sense. Sorry, I, I just mean there, there's an effective 1D QFT. Okay. Where where this this the space time is really just R. It's it's the, the line of time. And in that effective 1D QFT, everything just looks like quantum mechanics. Okay. And now boundary conditions are Lagrangians. Okay. And this this is the analog of taking something where like let's say you had the field theory the QFT for the field theory of the electromagnetic field, and then you tried to do just simply quantum mechanics with the electromagnetic field using Lagrangian. Sort of. Um, it's, again, Trent Simons is special. If I were playing this game with the NMOs, then everything would be more complicated, but I could do it. Um, I would say that the phase space consists of all bundles and gauge fields on sigma um, sub subject to some some flux constraint um, and that that would be a very large space um, and but it would give me a phase space and it would lead to the same sort of thing here in trans simons it's things are nicer because I don't just I don't get all gauge fields on sigma, but I get flat connections on sigma, um, and that that leads to this nice description in terms of local systems. But I, I'm playing the same game of saying quantum field theory on d minus one manifold times time is the same as quantum mechanics, whose target is maps from the d minus one manifold to the original target. Um, okay. So let me, now that I've covered the first 10 minutes of the talk, um, let me go to higher dimensions and say some more interesting algebraic things. Um, Sorry, uh, Tudor, could I interrupt one second? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, in this Chern Simons case, if you fix an L, a Lagrangian in P, uh, does it is is can you somehow canonically construct an ML? <laughs> um, in, in principle, right. um, if um, sorry, I mean the, the answer the answer is certainly yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In that the quantum field theory should be able to construct it for you. Right. Um, um, even like the 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 example of 
this that I am most familiar with involves quantization of the A polynomial, which is extremely tricky oh, yeah. uh, to get a, to get all of, all of the factors right. Yeah. And and there there are ways to do it. But, I see. I see. Um, yeah. So, so, sorry. Like, so, so, like, y your answer is is yes, absolutely, because you can feed everything into a path integral, yeah. um, and the path integral doesn't need to, to know about the module. The path integral just knows about the, that classical Lagrangian, right. um, and then correlation functions in the presence of this classical Lagrangian tell you the module structure. See, but your a polynomial story still is that's just one specific Lagrangian, right? Yes. But uh, uh, one cons people consider, I guess, other Lagrangians as well, and you can construct it in all such cases in some sense. Um, but we don't have to do this now. Yeah, sorry. I'll let yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you take an abel compact abelian gauge group, I think you can do this much more simply in turn time and stuff. I see. I, I agree with you, Greg. Yeah, but but there, there you're just, you're, your algebra just becomes the, the, the Vela algebra. Uh, the, the Vial algebra. It becomes uh, another Heisenberg algebra. It's right, I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Um, so let me Sorry, just get some nomenclature straight. A question? Yeah. Uh, well, to, for the last thing there is, uh, so if your uh, gauge group is complex, this is a uh, hypercalar manifold. So you need to specify uh, the Rangian with respect to what? Uh, it's... Uh, the standard right. so, so in defining Trin Simon's theory comes with some coupling constants. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a level, and if it's a complex group, there, there's also some continuous parameter around. Um, those will choose for you a real symplectic form. Um, I see. So, so there, there's, a, there's a choice to be made that's in the definition of the theory, and once you've once that's specified, there's a real symplectic form that tells you what Lagrangian is supposed to mean. Okay, thanks. And uh, is there um, a categorical uh, interpretation of this general expectation when uh, Ella Lagrange? So can one yes. think of this as a functor from the Fokaya category to uh, holonomic modules for A? And the morphisms between the Lagrangians should become uh, module morphisms? So the answer is yes. And if you literally want it in terms of something like the Fukaya category, um, I would connect with work of Gukas and Witten on brains and quantization. Um, but yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so, um, I want some nomenclature in higher dimensions before I go on. Um, so, um, the entire discussion I just gave for quantum mechanics is relevant for um, sort of classifying basic boundary conditions in higher dimensions. The basic ones I discussed in quantum mechanics were called Neumann and Dirichlet. Neumann set a derivative to zero and Dirichlet set a field to zero. Um, so the picture, um, if I, if I want to sort of microscopically describe a boundary condition in higher dimensions where I haven't compactified anything and like close up, um, near my boundary space time looks like R to the D minus one times R plus, um, I have some direction. Um, now this is a space time direction X perp and some, a bunch of other space-time directions x parallel um, to the boundary. Uh, then for scalar fields, basic boundary conditions. For scalar fields, uh, the action is typically quadratic and phase space um, is going to look like values of the scalar field and its normal derivative
at x prep equals zero. Um, and then the thing that people usually call a minimum boundary condition is setting the normal derivative to zero and Dirichlet is setting the field itself to constant. Um, for fermions, the action is typically first order based on sort of Dirac equation. Um, and so the phase space just consists of values of the various fermions, but not derivatives at x per equals zero. Um, and then there's no such thing as Neumann versus Dirichlet. The boundary conditions for fermions are to just set half the fermions to zero. This phase space comes with, with a symplectic form. Um, that is encoded in the action. Um, and for gauge fields, um, and here, strictly speaking, what I'm about to say is true in Yang Mo's theory, but not Chen Simon's. In Chen Simon's, things are a bit simpler. Um, for gauge fields, um, so this is where we have a theory with the gauge symmetry and, and the fields include a connection. Um, and a field strength. Um, and now the analog of Dirichlet uh, is that the pullback of the connection to the boundary is just set to be some constant and you fix it. So you, you fix a constant connection on the boundary um, and that doesn't, that doesn't preserve gauge transformations. And so in physics, one says Dirichlet boundary conditions like this break gauge symmetry at the boundary or uh, give you a global symmetry instead of the gauge symmetry. Um, and the way Neumann looks, I don't think there's a convenient way to write it in differential forms. Um, the components of the field strength that involve one normal direction and otherwise parallel directions is set to zero. Um, and because this is written in terms of the field strength and it's being set to zero, this is invariant under gauge transformations. Um, and so one says that Neumann preserves gauge symmetry at the boundary. Um, and so these are your, yeah. I have a question. So it's, it's not clear, is it, that you can always, that boundary conditions for the fermionic case always exist? <laughs> it did. You might not be able to set half the fermions to zero. Absolutely. Example, chiral fermion on a half one. I, I yes. Um, I agree. Um, Uh, the other thing I need to say is that when playing all these games, one needs to be very careful about anomalies. Um, if, if the boundary is even dimensional, caveat, if D is odd, so D minus one is even, uh, one needs to check anomalies. Um, and that, that's especially important in gauge theories, um, but also in sigma models, there, there are anomalies that come up and this is the same. Um, the analysis is entirely analogous to what has been done for years and years and years in bulk quantum field theories. We know that in, in four dimensions and six dimensions, there, there are all sorts of anomalies that come up. If it's a gauge theory, gauge anomalies have to be canceled somehow. Um, and the analysis of boundary anomalies is 
be a little bit less well developed, but but entirely analogous. Um, so, um, yeah, so so it can bite you uh, in, in three dimensions. For example, one has things like rosansky witten theory uh, with complex symplectic targets, and you might think, great, my boundary conditions should be holomorphic Lagrangians, except they don't all work because they might be anomalous. Uh, for the exact same reason that uh, if you're in two dimensions and you have the sigma model whose target is not Kalabiao, there's some anomaly in the R symmetry that screws up your topological twist. Um, so. Sorry, does the anomaly here mean that you can't go from L to ML? Yes. Okay. Thanks. There's the analog of ML is fancier in higher dimensions, but yes, um, it, it means you can't quantize. Right. Uh, you can't quantize while preserving a topological twist, or if it's a gauge theory, you just can't quantize. Uh, um, mm -hmm. They're like these anomalies break various symmetries that need to be used functionally either to topologically twist or to quotient by the gauge group or something like that. I see. Um, okay. Um, so I'm I'm gonna say one more thing and then I'm massively out of time and I haven't actually gotten to much algebraic structure at all in higher dimensions. Uh, so I'll I'll say one last thing. Um, which is that I've given you a bunch of basic boundary conditions and physically from sort of a very practical perspective, one starts with a particular quantum field theory, tries to write down basic boundary conditions um, and then asks like, is this it? What other boundary conditions are there? Um, and so there, there are also some basic operations. Um, there are maybe two really important ones. So sort of the trivial operation, um, which is to tensor. Um, with a uh, D minus one dimensional quantum field theory. Um, in other words, if we have a theory in D minus one dimensions with some arbitrary boundary condition B, um, you can come along so D dimensional theory has one boundary condition B, you can come along and say, well, why don't we just add a bunch of boundary fields that don't talk to anything in the bulk at all? In other words, just take a, a new D minus one dimensional quantum field theory and tack it on. Um, so um, this is analogous to just working in a single dimension of the bulk, just saying if you have quantum field theory A and quantum field theory B, you can build the tensor product where the fields, the operators just don't interact with each other at all. Um, and uh, Hilbert spaces become tensor products and, and so on. Um, so it's called zero because it's not so interesting. The, the more interesting version is to then deform. So I can, let me call this sort of thing TD minus one tensor B. Um, Form, so I can deform any boundary condition. Um, and there's a deformation theory involved. Um, if we're just in QFT, um, the deformation theory is complicated. Um, literally, a concrete way to think about this is that we now have a boundary action in terms of fields that involves both. I literally mean adding terms to the boundary action and changing coupling constants in the boundary action. 
Um, but there's a beautiful algebraic way to think about this that is convenient, especially in topological theories or partially topological theories. Um, and this involves solving some more Cartan equations. Uh, or higher categorical versions thereof. Um, and this is where causal duality and other things like that come in. Um, yeah, um, okay, so I need to stop. Um, I'm sorry, that was dreadfully slow. Um, hopefully it was at least a bit useful. Um, I can say some things at some point about um, categories and E and algebras um, and how things like holonomic modules get generalized to the higher dimensions uh, because they do. Um, part of that involves Poisson brackets coming from E and algebras. Um, but, but I will do that later, uh, well, yeah. depending Thanks on so audience preferences. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, Matilda, one thing that's come up is uh, I myself and some other people, I think uh, would think it's, it would be great to, if we could hear you uh, say what, you, what more you want to say. Now, so Magnus Carlsen, who's speaking next week, uh, had, uh, well, one possibility is this. I mean, uh, Magnus has postponed already once. Uh, would you feel up to speaking on the 31st by any chance? Would you be linked to do that? Um, you I quite stupidly cannot. Um, uh -huh. I, I will be in the middle of the Sierras for a few days, and it would be very awkward. Um, to try to find an internet connection. Ah, okay. How about next week? Um, is next week possible? Um, ne next week is fine, or or, or July, or like wh whenever whenever there's space. Um, the thirty first is in July. Just saying. Oh yeah. You oh, wait. <laughs> yes, I can't add. I'll anyway. see that, yeah. So, right. Magnus seems to think that next week is fine. So, shall we go for next week then? Um. Yeah, it's, it's it's totally fine with me. Sure. Okay. Not not teaching anymore. So almost anything works. No, that's great. Yeah, I, I think yeah, a lot of people want uh, want to hear the rest of your talk, but, and this was great. Yeah. So, uh, um, I think the original plan that Jeff and I had discussed with that was that we would break for the summer after the twenty third, twenty third. But there's no problem continuing for one more week. So let's. Continue with your talk. Um, sorry, Min Hyung, I think you should be aware of uh, the, uh, the the thirty first of June uh, is during strings, um, and strings is apparently going on oh, this year as a virtual yeah, conference. Good. Okay. Um, and so it may also it depends on on this audience. Um, no, that's a good point. A, a few people might want to listen to strings talks instead. Sure. Um, or it may not, not matter that much. I haven't, I did not take that close a look at the participant list. Yeah. Okay, I'll look um, at that schedule. In case, in case you're pushing things back. Anyway, next week is fine. Just let me know. Um, I'm happy to just do it. Yeah, th thanks everyone for okay. putting up with the sketchy presentation. No, no, it was great. So as usual, I guess uh, then having settled that, we can continue on to questions and discussion freely as, uh, as long as Tudor has time. So may I? Um, well, one is a generic question. If nobody else is asking, I'll ask it uh, now. Uh, are there boundary conditions in uh, supersymmetric extensions of uh, quantum field theories as well? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there are boundary conditions in any quantum field theory. So, so, so let me ask super, more. Su uh, supersymmetric theory is just a is just a quantum field theory with extra structure. The thing you want is the thing you need to ask for is that some part of super, the supersymmetry is preserved yeah. at, the, at the boundary. Um, and so there's a compatibility condition that you, you can apply 
Um, there are various versions of that. Um, so, so yeah. Okay, so some part of the supersymmetry algebra survives and acts on the boundary fields, or is mm -hmm. something more complicated? That, that's right. So um, there, there, there are two things to say. So, so first, remember that the supersymmetry algebra has these odd generators that anti-commute to give translations. Mm -hmm. um, so the supersymmetry algebra in, in the first place involves translations in space-time, and does, it only makes sense if you're in flat space. Mm -hmm. um, that's fine. So let's let's stick to flat space and to flat boundary mm -hmm. conditions. Uh, then, um, by default, um, whatever subalgebra of supersymmetry you preserve um, cannot contain translations perpendicular to the boundary. Um, and so, classifying possible compatibility conditions breaks down to um, classifying subalgebras of the supersymmetry algebra um, that do not contain translations normal to the boundary. Um, and so that always means uh, you can preserve at most half of the supercharges. And so you can ask for half the, some, some half of the supercharges to act, but there are different choices of halves. Um, and you can also ask for less. Okay, less supersymmetry. Okay, thanks. That actually clarifies why this transversal boundary condition is always important in uh, uh, thing. Thanks. And, and another, so this is a more uh, uh, basic question. It's again in your example of where you're looking at ML and ML is a, uh, and L is a Lagrangian in your face space. Yeah. Uh, it's essentially, uh, well, it, it, so generally first, um, if you have two, if you have two uh, generic Lagrangian submanifolds, they intersect in uh, finitely many points in general. Um, do these intersection numbers mean anything for the the two modules that you get, ML and ML prime? Sure. Um, so um, you can you can put your sorry. Let me. So essentially, you're choosing a pair of boundary conditions. Basically, that's the. So if you have a pair of boundary conditions in quantum mechanics, say L and L prime. Um, then you can consider a theory on an interval with L at one end and L prime at the other end. Um, and it depends what sort of quantum mechanics you have. If it's a topological quantum mechanics, the length doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you need to take a limit as t goes to zero. Um, this This should be counting for you the number of intersection points. The, uh, I... um, um, so the the path integral in this configuration is going to give you a number, mm -hmm. um, and it should be the number of vacua of of the theory and this limit on a segment, um, mm. uh, which which is going to be the number of Perception points. Um, um, in order to get something interesting like Hans and Fukaya category, we have to move up to higher dimensions. And instead of thinking of these as boundary conditions in quantum mechanics, we'll make them boundary conditions in a two dimensional theory um, and talk about like Hilbert spaces on a strip. Um, and that that will involve holomorphic disks and all of that fun stuff. Good. Okay. okay, thank you. I have one more question, but other people should ask first and I can go there. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, I sort of, I have a few questions, although mainly because I'm a number theorist and I'm sort of new to TQFT. Um, and I, I don't know if any of these were, were sort of covered in some of the earlier sessions, because I also just found out about the, 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 the seminar. Because um, I, I sort of, I, I was, I, I understand the idea that a d-dimensional 
TQFT, you know, associates a number to a D manifold and a vector space to a D minus one manifold and a category to D minus two manifold and all that. But like, so what, what are line operators? You were talking about those a lot. It, it's, the, it's the category associated to a D minus two sphere. Oh, it just is that category. Yes. So if, you're, if your starting point is axiomatic TQFT, it is that category. And so then if you, if you have a cobordism between um, D minus two spheres, mm -hmm. um, that gives you... Then you've uh, got see. yourself a Han in, in that category. Oh, that, right, that, so that gives you a Han in that category. Yes. Okay. Right, so the cobordism is a um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's correct. Uh, so a cobordism is a D minus one manifold. Um, and so you expect the TQFT to give you, to spit out a vector space. Um, but it's sort of a vector space that depends on inputs. So like, like your cobordism has boundaries. Right. Uh, so oh, okay. So I, un I understand for a D manifold, like ra rather than with, 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 without boundary, you get a scalar, but with boundary, the point is you get an element of the vector space of the boundary. And so maybe actually that, that this would be good to understand. So if you, if you have a, you know, D minus one manifold with boundary, I want to say you get a vector space that's in the category of the boundary, but I'm not. Right. So, sure what that means. sorry. So let's, I need to, I should draw some pictures. Um, so, so if we're in dimension D um, and, and we have a D manifold, and I'm, I'm actually going, I'll give it a single boundary. Sorry. This is super with boundary. So this is sigma D minus one, which I can't even write. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so then there are two ways to view what's going on. Um, either, so I understand that Z of M is an element of the vector space on sigma, right? Yeah, so that, that's what you usually see, um, yeah. correct? Um, but there's another way to think about this, which is, uh, so or, uh, given any object in Z of sigma, What do you mean an object in a vector then, space? Then Z of M, yeah, it just means a vector in the vector space. Um, so Z of M sort of decorated with V or with the data of V is a number. It's the inner product right. between the previous Z of M and V. Um, and I, I'm being really sketchy about duals and orientations here. Um, Makes sense. Um, Sam said a thing about undefunctors. Um, so, so now that same principle holds in the higher categorical contexts. So, if if you had a cobordism between two surfaces, then you would say Z of M is a ma is is a map from Z of sigma one to Z of sigma two. Um, alternatively, given vectors in sigma one and sigma two, you get a number. Um, so yeah. now what, what if you have a D minus one cobordism between- I, know, I understand that's like the probability amplitude for transitioning from one state to another. Yeah, exactly. So I, I understand um, that from D, for D, D minus one. I, I'm not sure what happens in D, D one minus one, D minus two. Right, so, so if you have two D minus two boundaries, um, then the analog of this is that Z of M D minus one, together with the data of two objects in the category of lines, okay. is a vector space.
Are you saying it's going to be Hom from L1 to L2? Um, no. Because then it should uh, depend on M, not just on L1 and L2. Exactly. So um, if M D minus 1 happens to be a D minus 1 sphere with two D minus 2 spheres removed, right. then you get Hom. And that's the same as just SD minus 2 cross R, right? Or no? Is it? Yeah, it is the same as SD minus 2 cross R. This is literally hum. OK. And when we say categories, we mean like linear categories, since well, this is a vector space. It technically mean some sort of infinity categories, but um, and by so everything in any reasonable example of a TQFT is cohomological. Um, if you're very lucky, there will be a DG model, and then this is a DG category, and hom means um, cohomology of X, um, or just cohomology of derived hom. Um, uh, uh, if you're unlucky, you have to mess with the infinity categories and. And it's, it's that. But I'm a little confused because you get like a one category in D minus two and a two category in D minus three and so on and so forth. So how would you get Y an infinity category? Sorry, um, I, I just like it's everything is up to homotopy. So let me let me just say it that way. Okay. So, um, so um, so, so linear is a good approximation, but it's it's like linear up to homotopy. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, would you say that z of m d minus one is something that sort of just it gives you all of the data of the z m d minus one l one comma l two? It gives you all of that data. Um, yes. Just just, uh, just like sorry. z of m is a right. z of m d minus two. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, no, it's, it's that, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's the SD minus one in general gives you, it's, it's sort of the same way that in my second example, Z of SD minus two times R defines HOM. Um, then yeah. if any MD minus one with two boundaries is going to define some other bilinear operation that gives a vector space. I mean, it's bilinear because these are really uh, Hilbert spaces with it with a. With a and no, it's because it's it's because these there there's a direct pro, like these these categories are very close to linear, so okay. it makes sense to add objects. Um, okay. So I uh, is, uh, wanted to. Uh, I think it's related to uh, the picture on the top left, where you have a d-dimensional manifold and a, uh, a one-dimensional lower manifold as its boundary. Uh, it's uh, so. It's in particular if you're. Uh, I'm trying to look for Lagrangian sub-manifolds in uh, the moduli of local g-local systems on a surface. And one uh, easy example is if you just fill in the surface and consider the handle body. So uh, half the homol well half the pi one just basically dies out, and you're just left with half the generators. And uh, you just so so that's those are one types of Lagrangians. Um, are there uh, so and these things also give you Lagrangian where you have a uh, a three manifold with a surface boundary. Yeah. So um, any right, any any three manifold with the surface boundary. If you right naively, you want to say that defines for you a Lagrangian inside um, local systems. Inside local systems, uh, of course, that's not true unless you think of this in a sufficiently derived way, um, and, yes. and 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 then if you do, it is. Um, there, there is there's all sorts of like like whenever you would say this ten years ago at a like a not theory conference, the entire audience would explode and say, like, no, character varieties have extra components and points and whatever. But oh, yeah, 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 of course. I was moduling all of that. Yeah, okay, of course. Yeah. Um, um, though uh, I am at least given to understand nowadays that if you 
treat everything appropriately as a derived stack, then mm. there's a definition of Lagrangian that, I, that is actually true. No, oh, okay. We're coming from this thing. Okay. So it's just that the nature of Lagrangians in this space are really, so the ones that we just discussed are really topological as a, coming from three manifold theory. Yeah. There so are other Lagrangians, but for this, you have to use non abelian Hodge correspondence, for example, the locus of Popers and uh, the Hitchin section in the Hitchin system case, and somehow using involutions on your gauge group, you can also construct some Lagrangians. That's and right. then there's this world famous Lagrangian, the global nil potent cone or the zero fiber of the Hitchin system. But it's just really strange because some are coming from geometry and some from topology. That's <laughs> right. To no. understand the complete uh, category of Lagrangians, it's... That's right. So let me maybe say something else. So I actually, I mean, the reason is the kind of, I believe, things that were considered in the previous talks by Skele Redes, uh, those were coming from group theoretic things. They were considering subgroups of your gauge group. So all of this exists. Um, so those, anything that's not a geometric Lagrangian um, mm -hmm. does not make sense unless you pass to an effective lower dimensional theory first. This sort of order of compactification matters. Um, if you're literally talking about 3D turn Simon's theory, then, it, then it, the only things you have are the geometric Lagrangians. Um, or if you want, you have like chiral boundary conditions that support vertex algebras, um, mm. which are not what we're talking about. Um, um, on the other hand, once you sort of reduce everything to a single dimension, then you have any Lagrangian in the world. Um, uh, you were, you mentioned categories of boundary conditions before that exists only once we add one more dimension. And so you start in 40, uh, with something like, uh, the geometric Langlands twist of 40 and mills, um, and compactify that thing on a three manifold with boundary or on a surface. Um, and then you can get categories of whose objects are Lagrangians. I see. Okay. Also, this difference kind of goes, I mean, it depends a lot if your group is uh, complex or uh, real. So for example, for SUN, all these exotic Lagrangians that I was saying would go away because uh, you don't have the Hitchin system. So for SUN, only the geometric Lagrangians would survive. So, sorry, what's the distinction? Um, so if you look at SUN flat connections on a surface, yes, this is a uh, a real manifold. I mean, it's a symplectic manifold. Symplectic because Goldman wrote down the symplectic form. Sure. But it's not a. Um, uh, Sorry, it's okay. not hyperkähler, but you it's not can, even Kähler unless you choose a complex structure on your uh, Riemann surface. Th th that's right, but but you can still have lots of non-geometric Lagrangians in that. So so, um, what are non-geometric Lagrangians for you? The ones that don't Me? come from three manifolds. Sorry, ones that don't come from three manifolds. Okay, this is surprising to me. Can you give me an example of a non-geometric Lagrangian in SUN modular? Well, three All manifolds. non-geometric I was constructing was using Hitchin system technology, but three manifolds are a countable set, and uh, because they can all be obtained by surgeries, and um, Lagrangians are clearly an uncountable set. Sure, of course, <laughs> but okay. It's just, in a, it's just sort of a stupid way. I, like, I suspect all of you. <laughs> I mean, it was a super non-constructive way, but I agree. <laughs> and, and, it, and if there's some category involved, then you would probably want to impose equivalences and say that like, the category is generated by geometric ones, and that's probably true. I don't know. Um, um, I see. Sorry, can I have a quick question because I have to go? D is there a good reference for, for TQFT that might explain some of these, like how does the D minus one dimension relate to the D minus two dimension? and I, 
I don't know of a succinct accessible one, but I'm sort of the wrong person to ask. Okay. Um, if yeah, if anyone does, please, please chime in or write it in the chat. Um, I mean, these kind of things go under the name of extended TQFT, so a Google search would be. In, in the realm of topological field theory, um, there, yeah, there, there, there's a ton. Um, if some, some, something less than 800 page Larry manuscripts are, are probably yeah. what you want to find. But yeah, yeah, I want something like maybe 30, 40 pages max, you know, just like, yeah. you know, a TQFT is, you know, it's not a D-dimensional thing is signs of this to a, this kind of manifold and that to a, that kind of manifold. And if, you know, this manifold is the boundary of that manifold, then this is, the relation that we get between them. So um, the great um, sort of toy example of transcendence theory with finite gauge group that was worked out by Dan Fried, maybe Telemann. Um, but if you if you look at Dan Fried and transcendence with finite gauge group or cobordism hypothesis, um, that or, or or just send me an email later. Um, okay. Okay. That that that's actually a really hands-on example. That that should be fun. It, it, also, if you're coming from a, a number theory perspective. Okay. I mean, I also it would also be nice to simply a, uh, a a very general definition as well. Yeah. I mean, examples are are nice. But... And that that has sorry that that has the general mantra at the beginning and then applies it to. Oh. Okay. Cool. Oh, Dan Fried and Quinn, Karen Simon's theory with the finite gauge group. I guess that's okay. Like the, the reason they were doing this was to give an example of, of the entire setup. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll work on that. Anyway, I got to go. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Great. Well, let me thank the audience again. Um, this was really fun. Um, and th thanks for the entire seminar series. Lovely catching up with. Great. Thanks for the great talk today. Today I'm here on, until the end of the question session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm also, and I, I can send you my notes if that's useful. Oh, that would be great, actually. I'll post it on the web page as well. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, awesome. Um, yeah, take care. Okay, see you, see you next week. Bye. Thank you, Baba. Thanks. Bye.